I'm here with Bon Halbert, and he's one of the best copywriters on the planet. Bon and Kevin are actually going to come down to Australia later this year for our Mastermind event. Um, I wanted to talk to you more about your earliest memories of working with your father, Gary. So my earliest memories are stuffing, stamping, and sealing envelopes as part of test mailings. And we, my dad believed fully that, that's, that everybody should do that on their own first. Right. So no matter how big we got and no matter how much we used mailing houses and how much mail we were putting out, the test was usually done as a, as a family event. Right. And so me, my brothers, and you know, my mother would sit around and do, you know, assemble the first thousand to ten thousand pieces of mail that went out. And so those are my earliest memories. He decided to start teaching me about um, direct marketing and like you know writing copy and understanding that it's an, a numbers business and understanding you know lifetime value of customers and all of the kind of stuff that you you start to learn. He, you know, he started teaching me that more formally and properly, probably with the range of 10 or 11. And so, you know, but at that point, I had already, you know, I'd known the power of marketing. I knew that, you know, we had gone from being, you know, very like lower middle class family in the small town to my dad being the richest guy in town. And, um, you know, and so I knew the power of what he did. And then, um, and I've, I've told this story a few times, which was he was down on his luck one time. And I said I was very fortunate because while my eldest brother got to play with all the toys, I was gonna be able to see how he did this, how he made himself rich. And he thought that was so sharp. And he's like, you know, if you're willing to watch that, let me teach you. And so he started taking me around and teaching me. So I knew the power of the business, but he started teaching me the ins and outs. And so I was on the inside of, with him when he was doing research, uh, when he was doing business meetings and all that. And so another more formative memory was probably when he was working with uh, the Borg Nines and doing the Tova Nine campaign and stuff like that. Now, I would see him in the, in the meetings talking about what they wanted to accomplish, like we want to put out a perfume or we want to do whatever. And I would see him doing the research and I'd be with him when he made discoveries and he always would, when he got it, he would snap his fingers and go, aha, I got it. And then he would quickly grab a yellow legal pad and write down the headline or the hook or whatever it is that he had. And so my earliest memories are that. And then of course, when he you know, started uh, doing seminars and he started taking on uh, you know, more clients and everything, I was working directly with him. Mm. So you were about 10 or 11 when you left school, is that right? Well, no, I didn't drop out of school. Right. But what would happen was, um, one of my earliest memories is my father would, you know, he pulled up, a, um, not pulled up, a, I was getting up to go to school and he said, you're not going to school today. And I said, why? And he said, well, you can learn what they're gonna teach you in school today, tomorrow. But uh, in my business, you can, I'm gonna show you where the magic happens. And he took me to a mastermind meeting between a top list broker, Jay, himself and Jay Abraham. And we went to, it's not, wasn't far from here at all. Um, and the, we went to this uh, restaurant, but it was off hours. So like we were the only people in there. And they were talking about lists that were available and what campaigns and what kind of offers to make to wow. them. So I got that idea, you know, I, got, you know, I spent my entire childhood listening to people say, Gary, how would you market this or what would you do? And my dad had um, usually um, uh, what they call, you know, John Carlton calls them 20 clicks, but uh, they were about 20 standard answers for what he would do for marketing. You know, this needs a celebrity endorsement, this needs a two-step mailing and so forth. So I spent, you know, I would be in the room and I'd be guessing what's Gary going to say. And I eventually got them right on the nose. I would be, I became the best in the world at figuring out what he was going to say. And I was going to say, okay, he's going to recommend a tear sheet mailing. Okay. He's going to recommend a two step. He's going to recommend a FedEx, you know, package. Um, and my proudest moment came when, um, my, my brother is much, much later. My brother was, uh, you know, had this product that he was thinking about marketing and he, called and asked me and he said, you know, I don't want you to talk about this with dad. You know, and the reason was is he just wanted separate independent answers. He goes, what would you do? And I said, actually, and he gave me information and he told me the reorder rate. And it was like at 97 or 
And I said, well, I'd give it away for free then, right? <laughs> And then uh, I spoke to my dad like every day. One day I was talking to him and I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm working on an ad for your brother. I said, oh, so he finally told you about that project. And he goes, yeah. And I said, well, what'd you tell him to do? He said, I told him to give it away for free. And that was not one of my dad's 20 standard answers. Oh, it, was, wow. it was one of the most rare, uncommon answers. But he yeah. saw the exact same thing I did. Wow. And I was like, okay, I'm, a, I'm like an expert in what, what Gary would do. <laughs> And then pretty soon, later on, in that industry, the most common marketing tactic became giving that product, mm -hmm. that type of product away for free as a, as a sample to get people into it. And um, so I was very, very proud, you know, because it was like, okay, it wasn't just, that wasn't an answer I had heard over and over and over again and knew by rote. It was something that, you know, that let me know, okay, I'm really thinking like him. Yeah. <laughs> So do you think that's where you really realized that you came into your own as an expert? You know what, it was, it was the process for me and the knowledge I got was gradual. You know, every, I, I try to explain this to people, everybody gets their self-esteem based on a comparison to other people. If you get an 80 on a test, you're like, okay, well I got a B, you know. Um, but then you find out that everybody else got a 100, you're like, oh, what's wrong with me, right? Or you find out everybody else got a 50. Yeah. And you're like, wow, I did really good. <laughs> so your self-esteem was based on measuring yourself right. compared to your peers. Yeah. Well, you know, um, you know, growing up, there was nobody who was my age that had the knowledge I did. I was, I was hoping there was gonna be uh, other marketers and assumed there were some other marketers who were teaching their kids at this early age. Mm -hmm. But when you're doing that in the 70s and the 80s, that was not the case. Yeah. You will find it now. You'll find marketers like, you know, teaching their children marketing tactics at the age of five or seven and stuff like that, that, you know, it's, you know, parenting has changed a lot. Mm. Um, but so I, you know, I knew what I knew and I would be amazed by comparison to people what they did not know. Mm. I would be amazed that there's somebody who's been in marketing for 10 years and they didn't understand the lifetime value of the client or they didn't understand what was obvious to me. And so it was a slow process where I started to really realize that I knew what I was talking about. But of course, I give the credit to my father. I don't think anybody who went through that experience spent that much time talking about marketing, spent that much time in business meetings at such an early age would know it. But I think the one difference that I made was I got it intrinsically so early. Mm. My dad yeah. quit his last, well fired from his last job the day I was born. He was 30 years old. So he started learning marketing when he's 30. I started learning <laughs> when I was 11. <laughs> and you get a different level of knowledge. And so my brother and I were trying to, you know, Kevin's very sharp too. We were, I remember trying to convince our father that the web was gonna be a big deal. And he's like, no, no, it's not, and stuff like that. We are able to take those concepts and those level of things and apply them and understand how they work in the modern world. So I was able to, you know, my dad had figured out, you know, how to get the mail opened and read in a way that all the other direct mailers didn't. Yeah. I was able to apply that same knowledge and principles in a way he didn't, and I'm not knocking him, in the way that he didn't to email marketing. Mm -hmm. And I all of a sudden was getting the highest email marketing rates. And, yeah. you know, the mailing companies were like, you're getting some outstanding rates. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but again, it all goes back to his training me. It's not like, you know, I'm, you know, it was just that you have it at such a core level that it doesn't matter the platform you give me. You know, I had somebody talk to me about um, uh, makeup and they, they wanted to know they were going to do a lipstick line for uh, teenage girls and they were about to do a Facebook ad campaign. And I'm like, why are you doing that? You need to do an Instagram is where you need to be. That's where the teenage girls are. Yeah. So no matter what the format is, I'm about where are the prospects? Where are they spending their yeah. time? Who's influencing them? Mm -hmm. How much does it cost to get a message through those influencers to that market? One of the things that I try and teach people is that you learn your persuasion skills from your parents, okay? And your, if your mom cries to get what she wants because things aren't going her way, you learn to cry when you don't get what you want. If your father rants and threatens or you know has a, has a, a temper tantrum to get what he wants. You learned to do that. Well, my father was one of the most persuasive people you had ever met. In fact, I'd ask my mom, why did you marry dad? And she said, well, he, he was amazing. He could persuade anybody to do almost anything. And I was, was really impressed by that. And so I 
picked up his way of speaking, his way of talking. You know, mm -hmm. you sound like your father yeah. or your mother, whoever was your influencer, mm -hmm. you know, growing up. So one time I was writing a commentary for, um, uh, uh, based on one of my dad's letters, and I was reading it to uh, a group of people, and John Carlton was in the group, and he said, you know, I couldn't tell when it was you writing or your father. Wow. And the thing is, I'm not, you know, he was, some people are shocked by that, but I would be shocked if I didn't sound like my father. You know, you, yeah. you grow up talking, you know, you know, and speaking and persuading the same way that your parents do. Well, my father didn't have one or two ways to persuade people. He had so many tools in his mm -hmm. tool chest because he was practicing different ways yeah. to get people to do things. And a lot of people who are copywriters, and you know, I want to say they're, they're working copywriters, but I wouldn't call them the very top copywriters. They sit down at the computer screen and think, what now? And they break out the books and they pull out outlines and they're doing all of this. Great marketers are persuading in person and then they realized, look, this, this got Ben's eyes to widen, so that's something that I want to pay attention to. Yeah. So I'm going to say something like that in my email. I'm going to say something like that in my ad copy. I learned persuasion techniques. I learned um, how to inter interact and engage with people. Copywriting is just putting that down on paper. You know, you don't, you know, this isn't about sounding like Hemingway and breaking out of thesaurus. In fact, I teach people to do the opposite. You don't break out of thesaurus to look for a fancy word. You break out a thesaurus to look for a more simple word, <laughs> you know. So, um, so one of the things that I think people really forget or need to know is, um, you do want to you research your market. You want to know them, but you know the best research you can do is really getting to know people in person if you can. Yeah. You know. So I think it, I think it's a I think it's a key thing that a lot of people forget, and they. They think copywriting is about sitting down at a white blank screen and like, where do I begin? And yeah. you know, the the amazing secret of blah 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> and they just they, and and what happens is they end up sounding unfresh or you know stale, should yeah. I say? And that's really one of the lost arts, really. I think today with internet marketing, is people like to hide behind their keyboards and not really go out and talk to people before they write their copy. Because I mean, that's one of, one of the things your dad did was he went door to door some of the times some of the times before he wrote his letters, right? Yeah, he would actually in the middle of the process he would go door to door and give them the pitch, and he would pay attention to where he bored them and to where he got it. And even when he finished his pitch, and I do the same thing, I read my copy to people who I know and trust. Now my my audience, because I, uh, you know, I teach people marketing and copywriting, so I'll actually call up a copywriter and read it, and I know I've hit it when they say, they don't just say, hey, when is that available, can I get it? I will get a call a week later and say, hey, is that ready yet? That's <laughs> when I know I really nailed yeah. it, and there, you know, I got, I got, the, I got the tone, I got the, the right points across. Mm. And that, you know, my father, he would go down to Mike's bar, um, in Ohio and he would read it to the crowd of guys and if they said that was you know really well written Gary he'd throw it away <laughs> if they turn he would throw it away unless they said I need that when can you know when can I get that myself right you know can you get me a deal on that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's when he knew it and so yeah being with people being among people is really key you know in a lot of all you know and that's the difference between like blockbuster promotions and just being able to call yourself a success. Mm -hmm. You can, you can, you know, start a um, thread in Facebook, and you can offer a uh, free, you know, info market, you know, info product, and so forth. Build a small list, you know, make a few sales. You know, you've invested nothing. You you make a couple hundred dollars, mm -hmm. and then say, I'm a profitable marketer. <laughs> <laughs> But that's not, you know, that's not the level yeah. that most of the professionals who are investing time and energy into becoming better and to building biz real businesses, um, that's not what they're, they're about. What they want to do is they, they want to grow into something that doesn't make, you know, that makes a million dollars per promotion, yeah. you know, on that, on that yeah. kind of level. And so um, what, you, you, what you really want to do is get real human feedback. and. Um, there, it's it's kind of hard because you know when um, when you read an article or something you wrote to your mother, right? 
she's going to listen to you. And she's not going to turn around and say, oh, that, you know, Ben, <laughs> you really didn't do a very good job there. Yeah. She's going to praise you and yeah. encourage you. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you want to seek out people who have told you, oh, no, I don't think that will work or I don't think that's interesting. Yeah. But not people who say that all the time just yeah. because they always want to shut you down out of jealousy and, you know, they don't want to see that you become a success yeah. or something. So, you know, you want to find people, you know, run it by strangers if you can, mm -hmm. or run it by your core audience. Yeah. And then Different. even if they're usually like very receptive, you want to see that they're extra receptive, mm -hmm. you know, and like I said, you know, it's, I know it's okay when they say, you know, I like that, can I get it? I know it's great when they've been thinking about it for a week and give me a call and are complaining that it's not ready yet. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, do you think that's that's like the core of the Gary Halbert solution? Um, that research and that really going out to the market and really, you know, being face to face rather than hiding behind the keyboard and the screen? Yeah, I think, well, I think there's also one other step to that. Um, his insatiable curiosity to know what makes everybody tick. Right. Um, nowadays, everybody specializes and you will find that, um, you know, copywriters will specialize a lot of times in an industry, but I like to say they really specialize in a prospect. You know, this person is really great at, you know, uh, middle-aged men who are self-made and looking to, you know, pay less taxes and then do, you know, do something with their investment. He knows their core thoughts and their, you know, their values and he can probably sell to them life extending supplements and investment advice and things like that. Or somebody else really understands the, the angst of teenage girls or something like that. And what the, it is is because they're, they're either in that market, they are that prospect, you know, or they spend a lot of time with that prospect. My father had a very insatiable curiosity for what made everybody tick. So he wanted to know what that, you know, what's the big thing that that waitress was hoping was gonna happen. He wanted to know how I thought. He wanted to know how, you know, college students, teenagers, middle-aged people, people who worked for a living, people who didn't work for, uh, you know, who worked for themselves, people who were investors. He wanted to know all about them and he would experiment and mess with them. He would try and see if he could make them angry. He would try and see if he could make them excited. He would try and see if he could make them get their greed glands going and wanting stuff and, you know, beg him for inf more information about something. And he would do that in person wow. all the time. Wow. And so he, you know, so he was, you know, I don't think there will ever be another Gary Halbert because, um, you know, he had this skill that could improve almost anybody's direct marketing and copywriting um, at a time when there were very few. So now you, if you want to go into finance, you're up against people who've been studying and marketing to people in finance for 10, 20 years. Yeah. They got a heads up. They got such a head start on you with research and the knowledge of the market, and the, they even know the numbers. This is where everybody's reading. This is where everybody. These are the YouTube channels they're watching. Um, information like that. Then um, they, you know, they're into a particular niche, and or they only understand a particular type of prospect. My dad was into all of them, and he could go and he had more records um, in more fields and more niches than anybody I can think of, mm. yeah. you know, and, you know, he's been widely, you know, talked about as the greatest copywriter who ever lived. And I think the reasons are is one, he had more influence over copywriters than anybody else. I don't know a copywriter who hasn't read the Gary Halbert letter, you know, not a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah. know um, anybody who's had record breaking promotions in so many different industries with so many prospects. And, it, and plus he wrote the most widely mailed sales letter in history. And I don't know if that record still stands, but it's a pretty darn good feather yeah, in its cap. Absolutely. What are some of the projects you've been working on um, lately or in the last few years? Um, one of the things that I've decided to do is try and I explain that the Halbert um, legacy is actually been carrying on through uh, you know my brother and I and actually trying to also indoctrinate my daughter into it in fact we call her the princess of print <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the things I started you know I started teaching her how to do um, you know website and um, e direct mail and or not direct mail excuse me uh, email marketing and I actually um, got her to 
uh, she, she, she has a knack, had a knack for it. And so she would send out an email and get like a 76% open wow. rate. Um, you know, not on a great big huge list, but mm. not on a list of halberd indoctrinated people. Mm. So, you know, one of the things that's always a point of pride for me is when I can, um, you know, when I can show people, give them ideas that they effectively use and they don't know the Halbert name and stuff like that. But one of the things that I have been working on is um, a lot of Halbert legacy stuff. Right. So cementing my father's, um, rep, you know, rep, uh, reputation in history has been important to me. So one of the things that we've done is what we call the Gary Halbert Letter Audio Series. It's the all-star audio series. And so what we did was we reached out to the very best copywriters in the world and asked them if they would each read into an audio recorder a letter of, of the issue of the Gary Halbert Letter and add valuable commentary. And they did, and we got, I mean, it's the best of the best copywriters <laughs> on the planet. So cool. And they started doing that, and um, we're going to con we're continuing to do that. I just got a few more people assigned this earlier this week, <laughs> and um, we're doing that. The other thing is, I started um, expanding on what my father had taught by explaining to people, um, like I said, how to get their emails opened and read, um, how to you know how to take the, the lessons and the the you know the principles that he taught into, into the modern world. And the most recent thing that I had done is I had created a book on copywriting editing because I realized that nobody really covered that subject ever before. And it's true that all the power in your research, is, all the power in your marketing is research. Knowing your prospect mm -hmm. is going to be more valuable than anything else. Yeah. Um, the knowing the talent comes in developing a unique hook offer or solution that really makes your marketing stand out amongst against everybody else's marketing yeah. all your professionalism comes in the editing phase right. anybody can have a really great brainstorm in a shower while driving down the street right um, and if you really know you know if you really know your market that becomes easier but what the professional copywriters will do is slave over every word and how they, you know, they'll reword things to make sure that they're keeping people reading, that they're keeping people exciting, excited, and that they won't forget um, some core fundamentals. Like I see, I was explaining this to a group of people not long ago, one of the biggest things I see missing in the ADA formula, attention, interest, desire, and action, is, uh, you know, a failed sense of urgency. Because if I say, hey, I have this copywriting course that's available for you. And they say, well, you know, that's a Halbert course that's going to be available forever. This other person's got a special course, but it's, you know, the bonuses are only good for this week. They immediately think, well, that other course is going to be there. Let me right. get the one with the bonuses. I'll come back to this one. And yeah. in sales, delay is death. <laughs> yeah, that's it. They just won't do it. So I will find, um, but so in, in marketing, you know, I'm writing a series of books that is about, you know, one about research, one about um, uh, how to get the, uh, the first draft, and then about editing that. Because the smallest f part of the, phase, of the process of copywriting is actually writing that first draft. That's where everybody thinks that they're gonna spend all their time. It's not true. Yeah. It's researching, walking around, thinking about your pitch, figuring out what you're gonna say to somebody, creating a unique hook offer or solution. And then I call it the copy dump, where you just dump all that stuff down in words. And then you massage it and polish it and rearrange words. And you know, you're reading it aloud, finding any place where there's a hiccup. You're thinking to yourself, okay, at this stage, somebody's gonna be thinking this, so let me address that answer and move it up ahead before they think about it. All of that kind of stuff. So that professionalism comes in the editing phase. And the top copywriting teachers and coaches and mentors will all tell you, research, 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 and then edit, 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 edit. But I realized nobody talks about editing. Now my father did uh, for a brief period, but his editing formula was only five steps, right? right? Yeah. And um, I, you know, when I started writing down all the things that I look out for, and this came about because I was helping professional copywriters write better copy. I was helping them smooth over copy that was either already working or they were about to release. And then I realized, okay, I'm telling all these guys and ladies who know what they're doing, 
the same lesson over and over, so I'm gonna write it down in a lesson, right? And I would teach them that. And I'd find that I'm teaching this over and over again, so I finally decided, you know what, let me put this all into a formula. And my formula, my editing formula, has 32 steps to it. Now, that doesn't mean you're gonna be reading your copy 32 times to do it. Yeah. So just like you're reading your copy aloud at the same time that you're looking for superfluous vats, or mm -hmm. you are looking for places that are gonna have hiccups and stuff, you know, you're looking, these are just all these different things that you should be looking out for and rearranging in phases. Um, and so with that, I, so I was doing the, the book series and the third one came out first. So I called it, you know, the Halbert Copywriting Method Part 3. Yeah. And we ended up calling it the Star Wars launch because <laughs> Part 3 came out before 2 and 1. <laughs> so I've almost got 2 finished, you know, yeah. and Part 1 is actually going to be a collaboration amongst a lot of great marketing experts right. and stuff like that. But what I was really proud about was the fact that it uh, immediately started helping people write a lot better copy. It had great copywriting advice I had never heard from anyone else. Not all of it, some of it was standard. Yeah. You know, you can't ignore the basics. Um, and it, it, it expanded on what my father had started. So my thing has never been to usurp or take over my father's um, legacy or to even you know pretend that I'm even close to being a Gary Halbert or anything like that. It has always been to just add to the information that the Halbert family is giving to the copywriting world. Yeah. You know, yeah. I want to add to it. I, you know, my biggest fear is, um, and it's not a fear anymore because I know I've already accomplished it, but my biggest fear is that I'm going to say something that's going to take away from the Gary Halbert legacy that he has built and created. Right. So, you know, and my father, as he always said, which is 100% true, and he, he said, look, anything you do, I, the right, I get 100% credit for it because I trained you, I taught you, I raised you. Anything you did wrong, I have nothing, that's your mom's fault, I have nothing to, <laughs> you know, you can't blame me and so forth. So anything I do wrong, I, you know, I take upon myself. Yeah. <laughs> but anything I do right, I do give credit for him because he is the one who taught me how to think. Yeah. You know, and he taught, he taught me how to, to market and to view the world. Yeah. Through Gary Halbert eyes. Well, you've been doing this for a long time now. Yes. Yes, a yeah. very long time. In fact, I used to, um, you know, when I would tell people that I had been marketing around it for 15 years when I was 30, they'd look at me like, okay, you're just, you know, lying and you're just, <laughs> you're making a, a ridiculous notion. Yeah. And then I was talking with a friend of mine and I said, if it weren't for the bar and letters, I wouldn't have any proof of this really early education in marketing. And I said to him, and this, this goes back to what we were saying earlier. I said, thank God my dad went to prison, right? <laughs> <laughs> and because of that, my friend laughed really loud and I was like, okay, that, that's it. That, and so I went and turned that, you know, that became a, a subject line for an email and everybody's like, that was a great subject line. Everybody had to open and yeah. find out why you would be thankful. <laughs> you know, the curiosity <laughs> element and that was just so powerful. But it really is true. Nobody, if it wasn't for that, people would not understand the level of knowledge I got yeah. so early gifted it to me upon you know by my father yeah from the top top copywriter that ever lived yeah as well i mean it was it, it was absolutely <laughs> you know i the one thing i have never let let go of or failed to recognize is that's just pure dumb luck you know i mean it's you know there is there's a great friend of mine of uh, uh my father's who was there at that time and he goes well you know but i gotta say something you couldn't have taken other kids into those meetings the way he did you you know yeah. you know you were not not only immature or you know you would add to the equation whenever possible and you absorbed it you understood it in a way that a lot of people didn't yeah absolutely yeah um, i mean definitely i mean you deserve the success you've got because it's not just because you were in the right place at the right time but it's what you brought to the table as well yeah, you even take that into account. Definitely. It, eventually, it did happen, and I was yeah. my dad's biggest advisor. And like I said, we're the ones saying, "Hey, you know, pay attention to the web; it's going to be big." Um, but on, and furthermore, later on in life, you know, um, I was his number one go-to guy for all kinds of not just life but business advice. He was mm -hmm. my number one advisor as well. You know, I don't want to take away from that. Yeah. But the, you know, that became out because he would realize that I had his thought process, his training, his understanding of the world. And so if he was emotional about something or too close to a subject or he was into a marketing campaign, 
and you know, you know, had money on the line or something like mm -hmm. that, it was easier to go get a more calm, you know, uh, opinion about it, and somebody that he trusted could think on, you know, his level. Yeah. And so that, you know, we we were both each other's greatest advisors. And it wasn't until recently, I, you know, when I ended up working with him, the last project that we worked on together. It was through um, a product that I had developed, and we worked on it together. I ran the the thing. The you know marketing um, was driven by him, of course, because you know if you get the best copier in the world, you let them write the copy. <laughs> um, but we did that. He took home more money from that project than any other project he had ever worked wow. on. Now that's not to say it's the most successful project, mm. because when you work for clients and you make a client twenty million dollars, yeah. you get to take home you know. Half a half a mil, yeah, right? Yeah. But when you work on your own project and you know you make six million dollars, you yeah. get to take home more than a mil. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't, you know, I mean, I don't want to pretend like it was the same success as the the as the coat of arms letter yeah. or you know you know some of the other ads and campaigns that he had worked on, um, but as a hired gun. Yeah. But but that's how close we were. That's how closely we worked together. That's you know. Incredible. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I'm, I'm, no, I'm very proud of what, um, you know, of what my father gave to me and what he did for me, and I'm very proud of what I was able to give back to him as well. It's interesting, you know, you had the collaboration with your father and you could call him and he could call you about different projects and get, it's that sounding board, really, isn't it? But a lot of people don't have that, so, you know, the idea of masterminding is obviously a thing that a lot of people talk about these days, so, you know, what do you think about that whole masterminding thing and, and how that can help people? Well, one, I think it's um, I think it's critical to be honest with you for people to be s successful. I was fortunate that I grew up in a family that was very supportive of marketing and direct marketing. Okay, most of the time, people in our industry, it's gotten better over the years, but most of the time, they're facing an onslaught of friends and family that don't want them to succeed, have no knowledge about what they're doing, have a complete misconception of what they're doing or trying to accomplish. And those who even want to be supportive know so little they can't be supportive. You know, so I had the sounding board of, you know, <laughs> a marketing genius. Um, my father had um, sounding boards of, you know, top guys. And he would, you know, call and read to me every issue of the Gary Halbert letter. I heard them before they were printed. You know, I heard them while he was reading them off of his own handwriting. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, but, you know, he knew the value of that too. In fact, um, I hate to show my age, but masterminding used to be called brainstorming, right? <laughs> <laughs> and a long time ago, um, they would have sessions that were, you know, brainstorming sessions, and you'd pull together top guys who are different facets of the industry and everything, and you get them in a room together, buy them lunch, and, you know, everybody would talk about how to improve each other's situation and business and, you know, give them ideas. And you'd be amazed at what people did and did not do. Um, one of my dad's favorite, um, inspirations was Joe Carbo who did Lazy Man's Way to Riches right. and my dad was just dumbfounded when he found out that Joe Carbo not only did not sell anything else to the people who bought that <laughs> course he threw away the names Whoa, and my great. dad's like you know, you're throwing, you know do you have any idea that you can make two three four times as much money just because you've already paid for the lead <laughs> and just by mailing them an offer but the the point is there's always something that you're forgetting and you're overlooking mm. you know yeah. um and so even getting together with somebody who has the exact same knowledge you do they'll say you know hey wait a minute you know i was reading your thing and you're so wrapped up in how brilliant your hook was how great that that offer was or something you forgot a sense of urgency or you forgot you know this this very key important part that you know about right and so that's just brainstorming with people who have your exact same level of knowledge. Mm. When you brainstorm or have a mastermind with people who have a higher level of knowledge, that really ups your game. First of all, they can tell you a key concept that all of a sudden, you know, you know, it just, it becomes so golden because it exponentially grows your business and your effectiveness on something because they, you know, they, you know, people discovered it. There's a lot of, um, uh, there's so much value in it. In fact, I always say that you want to join at least two masterminds. You want to mastermind with people who are in your industry because they've solved the problems already that you have. And so instead of spending a year and a half, two, three, four, five, ten, or never 
10 years are never finding the solution. They just tell you in three seconds and they go, oh no, this is what you do, That's, this solves that problem. I had that problem two years ago. Yeah, it's good. And if you also want to get with people who are, um, if possible, on a higher level, in, but also you want to get with people who have experience in different industries, because then what you can do is you can relate and take that from one industry to yours, and when you do it, it doesn't look like you're copying the other guy in your industry. It looks fresh to the prospect. People don't understand what doesn't look fresh sometimes, but they get the feel for it. They understand, you know, if you opened up a pizza parlor today and say, we'll have it to you in a half an hour or less, nobody's impressed by that, nobody. You know, when Domino's did it the first time, everybody's like, oh yeah, finally somebody's <laughs> doing that. Yeah. You know, so if you, you mimic, you know, so to, you want to bring freshness to a campaign, um, you want to bring freshness to your business and, you know, really stand out, you can get a lot of great ideas from people who are doing different experiments and doing different things in different businesses. So I think masterminding is critical and um, everybody should have a little brain trust of people that they can, you know, get, get with um, on a regular basis. Mm -hmm and get real feedback from professionals who really, you know, that walk the walk and don't just talk the talk. It's, it, and you know, my father understood that concept uh, right from the beginning. I mean, I don't know, I can't think of any mastermind or brainstorming groups that happened before. I'm not giving him credit for developing the idea. I know that the, the words and the, the idea has been around even longer, but in direct marketing, you know, my dad was doing that right at the get go. Mm. Yeah. And so, and you know, you talk to any of his closest friends, they'll have a phone record of him calling them and reading to them ads, reading to them, you know, uh, newsletters and, you know, running, running copy ideas behind it. But it's even more importantly, talking about the ideas even before he's writing or getting yeah. into the promotion. It's interesting because, you know, he was obviously the top copywriter, um, you know, to ever be, mm -hmm. but he, he recognized the importance of soundboarding process and, and collaborating and masterminding. So it's pretty interesting. Well, I always say, you know, the, it's, um, you need a certain, what I call jaded optimism. Okay? okay. And by that means you need to be optimistic enough to think, well, let's give this a shot. You know, maybe it'll work, yeah. but you have to be jaded enough to say, well, you know, if, you know, this may work, but you know, the, here's these problems and so forth. This is what, you know, th you know, they're not, you know, they're not going to just immediately love it because I love it, you know? And so that way, what you do is you say, well, let me find a way that they're going to love it based on what they want. And so there, you need to, um, have real realistic expectations. Um, and f another example is, you know, the, 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 the success rate of direct marketing campaigns. Everybody who you talk to, they'll talk about their successes and people only want to talk about the successes. Um, but the truth is, it's a lot of learning experiences. Some people call them failures. Yeah. You know, successful people call them learning experiences. Yeah. yeah. And so you have to be, you know, jaded enough to say, well, okay, they're not all going to work, you know, because that, or realistic, maybe that's not jaded is the right thing. But then you, you get optimistic because you say, well, you know, one in 10 of these is gonna work. Mm -hmm. And when one in 10 hits, hits it out of the park, I've got a large list to roll it out to or a large audience that I can market to and make it really successful. So it's, um, you know, it's the, the mentality behind that. You have to, you know, there's also a certain amount of, um, I, the term I like to use is it's, I like to say that I'm not arrogant. I'm just confident everybody else is as screwed up as I am, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of a copywriter or marketer will go into a gym and realize, you know, the truth is I just want to look better naked, right? <laughs> <laughs> so while everybody else is, sell, you, know, you know, doing this, you know, you'll just be healthy and yeah. this will lower your cholesterol. Yeah. The truth is most people are working out because they want to look better, you know? <laughs> and so it's easier yeah. for you to use language and to use imagery and to use all of these other things. And so that's mm -hmm. why it's more successful to say, you'll have your beach body bikini by summer, not yeah. you will be healthy by summer, 
you know? Yeah. And that's because uh, a marketer is like, okay, well, this is the real truth about why, the psychology behind why people buy this or yeah. emotional by why people buy this mm -hmm. or that. Yeah. And um, so a good marketer is gonna be, you know, very in tune with the audience and honest about things that even the audience won't admit. You know, you talk to anybody at the gym, why are you there? No, you know, who's gonna say, because I wanna look better naked? <laughs> They're all gonna say, because I wanna get healthier, yeah. you know, because my doctor told me to, mm -hmm. you know, I was getting older and I wanted to be, you know, more nimble, or I wanna get more energy. But, you know, what's the real core value? Yeah. <laughs> now, that's not everybody. That's yeah. the other thing there. I also yeah. don't believe there are any absolutes in marketing. You know, there's, there, um, there are few, you know, uh, absolutes in, in, in marketing at all because mm -hmm. we humans are so vastly different. Yeah. There's definitely somebody at the gym because the doctor told them to go to the gym, you know. <laughs> and one of the things you talk about a lot is, is on hooks, offers and solutions. So I just wanted to get your insight into, you know, what that means and how people can really take that away. Well, you know, your marketing to stand out versus the competition. The reason to go to one pizza joint over another, the reason to go to one gym over the other, the reason to get somebody's info course over the other. What makes them stand out is either a, or a business of success is either a hook, offer, or solution. Now, a hook is something that gets somebody's attention. My favorite hook is my father's, you know, wife of famous movie star swears under oath her new perfume does not contain an illegal sexual stimulant, <laughs> right? No perfume company was saying anything close to that, right? So that really grabbed your attention. Yeah. It stood out from, you know, from the, the, <laughs> the kind of vague, weird statements that Image Advertising in Madison Avenue was putting out. Um, an offer is something that really stands out compared to the others, like, you know, we'll give you a double your money back guarantee or, you know, um, so, the, you know, the offer, if it is unique enough, it becomes your hook as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and a solution, the solution is, comes in two different forms. You can have a solution to, for the, for the customer. Okay. So you're, you're giving them a solution, which again, can be your hook which is, you know, you don't know that the pizza is going to arrive on time, but we got a solution. We guarantee it's going to be there in 30 minutes. Um, or, you know, we, you know, our, our, our course comes with a guarantee of, you know, hooking you up with other people who will, you know, uh, put you in business and things like that. So it could be a solution for a customer or it could be a marketing solution. A marketing solution, uh, the example I like to use for that is somebody um, you can get advertising for half off of what everybody else is paying. Right. So therefore, you can afford to spend more money and get your name and your brand, build your brand faster uh, than your competition. Okay. So it could yeah. be a marketing solution right. as well. Mm. You know, pooling, finding a new pool of prospects and a new way of doing that. So, but if you have a unique hook, offer, or solution, you get an, that's what gives you an advantage in your business over other businesses that are in your industry. So I think that, you know, you go, you're doing your research, and if you do your research right with markets and um, so forth, what you're really sifting and looking for is a unique hook, offer, or solution. Yeah, I get it. You know, and then you, you know, you, you get that, and then you, you, you put it all down on that first draft, and then again, you edit and polish. So I think the unique hook offer and solution, recognizing them, developing them and everything, a lot of it comes out of hard work, but um, a lot of, that's where I also think there's a lot of talent. You know, talent will come in and give you, here's a neat, unique idea that you could try that people will respond to, right, yeah. you know, and get them excited um, faster. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you could be really talented or very experienced, you know, a lot of times talent is really just a massive amount of experience. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> which you obviously have. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm known as one of the, the, the better idea men in the business, and I will get people who, you know, I remember one gentleman, he said, um, how would you market in this, this industry and this particular product? And I said, well, here's what they all really want, and this is what they're thinking and so forth. And based on that idea, they just, you know, um, built this campaign, completely based on two campaigns. Yeah. One did a few million and the other one did $20 million. Wow. And it was an info product. So, you know, $20 million info product, that's a yeah. lot of profit. <laughs> um, but, you know, these are things that I can't, you know, but again, it's not because 
uh, I'm Einstein when it comes to marketing, it's because, you know, after this much time in the business and paying this much attention to people in all walks of life, it's yeah. a lot easier for me to give somebody a solution or to give somebody a hook and, or an offer. And I'm also very much a, I don't believe in, I don't have a can't do attitude. I have a can do attitude. And so when it comes to finding a solution, because that's another thing that a really good businessman or, um, you know, a, you know, a sharp marketing lady will figure out is if somebody says, well, you know, you can't do that. They won't do that for you and so forth. And you, you say, well, maybe that's not true. Maybe I can find <laughs> a way to get that done. Maybe mm. I can find a way to get through that gatekeeper to get the deal that yeah. I want. Maybe I can, you know, do that. And they will come up and say, with a solution and say, how can I solve this problem? When everybody, the majority of the world gives up on solving problems. The majority of the world gives up on just how, mm. how to solve an issue, yeah. you know, and the people who are really successful in life, they don't give up. They're, they think, okay, well, I'm going to try this and we'll try, that doesn't work, I've got something else to try. You've obviously been doing this for a very long time, since you were 11, and um, this is the first time later this year you're going to come down to Australia with Kevin. Um, you know, how much traveling have you been doing and, um, you know, why, why now? Why are you going to come to Australia now? Uh, well, there's a few reasons. First of all, the stars have all aligned. Okay, um, I've done a lot of traveling for business when I was younger, um, being you know helping my father host and put on seminars and so forth. And so I burnt out at an early age. You know, a lot of people think you know you know you get to travel the world for business, and it's like. No, you get to get on a tube of an airplane, stand on a line to get into a tube of an airplane, you know, fly somewhere, you know, get into a taxi cab, go to a hotel room in a hotel where you're going to stay for three days, yeah. and then you're going to get, you know, do the process, reverse the process and get back home. So I didn't like traveling for business after a while. The, 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 the luster wore off. Then um, what happened was I had children. And I'm one of those people who really believes that you should learn from what people who've been in your situation have t taught you. Take that advice because so many times they're right. And I was always told, enjoy your children while they're young. So I don't like traveling for business. The biggest reason I don't do it is because I have a young son. And, but, you know, and I figured until he turns a teenager, once they're teenagers, they're like, you know, I don't, you know, you can leave for a month and they barely notice you. When you walk <laughs> back in, it's like, hey, dad. <laughs> um, but my son's about to turn to, to a teenager and he's my youngest. Yeah. So I've decided that it would be okay for me to do longer trips. Now I will still, you know, I've been still traveling locally, but yeah. never more than a, you know, few hour plane ride away. Yeah. Um, and then there was the time when, you know, and then now I have met some really fantastic um, people in our industry, in like you, that are and there. Are so many of them are from Australia. If you took a if you took a heat map of where, you know, the direct response industry is, you're going to find you know majority like of a list or mm -hmm. something will be in L.A. or not in L.A. in the, um, in America, and then you'll see some in the U.K. But you'll see a really red hot spot in Australia. <laughs> And so Kevin called me, told me about the incredible opportunity you've offered us, and we said, you know what, we'll take it. And so you hit us at the right time. Um, you hit us at the right point in what we're trying to do, and you, it's the right, the right audience, it's the right everything. So the stars have aligned, and this will be our first trip to Australia, and it will be our first marketing trip abroad. You know, this is good. This is big. It is. It is. <laughs> it's going to be fantastic. I'm really excited. It's going to be fantastic. No, I am too. Yeah. I, I. You know. I mean, I just intend to do whatever I can to bring as much value to that audience as possible. Yeah, and I know you will. So it's going to be great. Thank you for your time today. It's been good to talk to you about, you know, all things marketing. Mm -hmm. um, you have a wealth of knowledge, obviously. So we could talk for for hours and hours, but. Um, we better not. <laughs> well, we can do that in Australia. Sounds good. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Bond. Great.